And then you obviously go into that first night of seeing the Strokes. Um, I'm sure you've <laughs> were very well rehearsed in talking about the story, but um, yeah, you're actually more impressed with another band that night. Now, the first band that came on was really my cup of tea. Like it was so good. They were like a British invasion band, but they were from America and they had great harmonies and great songwriting. And I totally fell for them. And the Strokes was like, okay, yeah, they're pretty cool. I'll give both bands my card because I want to work. And the first band that I liked, they didn't come over to my studio. But a couple of days later, the Strokes showed up and uh, we started working together. And yeah, you said you've got some cool stuff still, like Albert's um, number on the back of the business card uh, and stuff yeah, like that. I, have, I, have, just, I mean, I gave them my card, but then Albert said, hey, why don't you write down my number in case I lose your card? You know, So I wrote down Albert's number on another card, and I still have that one in my little collection of things. And you've got some of Julian's notes as well. Yeah, I have some of his... Um, kind of handwritten uh, lyrics in my book there's actually a picture of one of the pages he gave me permission to use it <laughs> I thought he'd get upset that I you know because he left them at my studio and I just as I was moving out of that studio I just found a pile of papers and it's like oh there's the original lyric sessions from the modern age EP I'll just keep these with my things but he was very, he was very gracious about it and you know you talk about how Kind of unique they were as a band in terms of how, how sharp they were and how understanding of each other they were kind of how they communicated with each other yes the communication was extremely impressive but the most impressive thing was how they played and how they rehearsed and just the fact that they were not going to let anything go like nothing was going to be good enough it had to be right in every aspect and I wasn't used to that from young musicians at the time. <laughs> Most people were just like, it's not rocket science. It's close enough for rock, you know, like that kind of attitude. But these guys were meticulous about getting things correct. Yeah, and like I love the way he described Julian's, um, you know, the way he described things. He described it as cryptic poetic ciphers, yeah, um, does, which does. are great. And I love the fact you can remember like a lot of them like do you have a favorite one of one of those <laughs> uh, i think you say things like hey you know the drum set well it sounds like the whole drum set is at a party but the toms can't get in you know they're, just, they're, they're sad they're sitting on the sidewalk because they can't get in can you make it so they're all at the same party like things like that yeah great and uh yeah it's interesting when he said julian like you know with with most bands or every band that you worked with the lead singer was always raring to go and record, but Julian was a bit different. Right, right. All the singers are just basically waiting for the band to finish their track so they could prance out and have the spotlight shine on them and, you know, show everybody how great they are. And Julian was actually, like, reluctant. He, was, uh, he took a big sigh and <laughs> walked out. He didn't really want to do a sound check. He just wanted to, you know, can we just start recording? I don't want to, like, do this. And... It was like, I'm thinking, what is this attitude? You know, I'm not used to that. And it was, it was very endearing after a while. And you actually said you felt sorry for them because, you know, they had this great music, but you right. had seen things in magazines with like guitars and gravestones and you're like, they're just not going to get heard kind of thing. I felt, yeah, when I first recorded them, the first revelation was, oh, you know, because I saw them live and I didn't think much of it. But in the studio, when I actually mic'd everything up and I heard the songs enough, I was going, like, this is super interesting. Like, I really like it. I can totally relate to this music. I'm glad I'm recording it. Look how serious they are about it. But ah, it's too bad they're born like either 20 or 10 years too late because nobody likes guitar music in New York. And from my friends in London, they also told me that clubs were shutting, gig venues were just shutting down en masse, and it wasn't a popular thing anymore. Um, acid jazz, house music, jungle, drum and bass, anything but like rock and guitar music was coming really into fashion at that time. So I kind of felt like, oh, it's a shame. Like, listen to that, how serious they are about what they're <laughs> doing, but just the wrong time for that kind of music. Yeah, yeah. So obviously you could never have predicted the type of influence they would have. 
No, I wouldn't even expect it that well that they would get like a deal or make a record. <laughs> I thought that they would just continue playing these free admission rock and roll venues in the Lower East Side for a while and then like go to college eventually or something. And then yeah, we had some questions, so I'm gonna try and like feed them in, but um someone on Instagram called uh Arin Arin Kant was saying who had the idea for the distortion on the mic? But that's your idea, right? Um, it was kind of my idea at first because I had been listening to industrial music all through the like nineties and early two thousands. I was that's when when I time to make my own music. I was using a lot of drum machines and synthesizers and heavily distorted vocals because my favorite band was Skinny Puppy from Vancouver, Canada. And they had a process they invented called the shitalizer, which made the voice actually sound messed up, completely messed up. And so when when it came time to record Julian's voice for the first time, I said, hey, look at this cool sound. And I put the distortion on 10. I put the tube preamp he was singing on on 10 just to destroy it. <laughs> I thought that would be a good idea. And when he heard it, after he sang the song, he said, "That I hate that sound. That is just awful, really ugly sound. But what if you like dial it back a bit? He basically gave me some cryptic ciphers. You know, your, relax, your, your favorite pair of jeans. That's what he used. He said, you know how comfortable those are? But they're not brand new. Can you do that with the voice sound? And okay. So instead of 10, maybe four and recorded him one more time and it was like everybody in the room loved it including jp their guru yeah yeah i was enjoying um your description of jp was quite funny like the things you come out with um yeah one example i think it was like <laughs> so it sounded like you just like kind of sit on sit on the couch and then one now and again he'd say something like hey god and why don't you cut out 100 hertz on nikolai's bass and boost the kick drum at 1k and you kind right. of didn't really Absolutely. understand what it's on about well the only reason i mean i've been recording for many many years but i never went into it technically so i didn't know what 100k is or 1k i'll I, that's, I just know that huh it sounds dull let me pump up the treble let me pump up some high i knew how to do stuff but i didn't know the technical new number i was never good at math so numbers never entered my game. So when he would call these things out, it was like, I would just roll my eyes and go like, I don't know what he's talking about, but I think he wants me to brighten it up. So I would do something and he'd go, yeah, that's great. Yeah, good. <laughs> and then Andy Douglas asked, uh, how much input did JP Bowstock actually have on the songs? Like he's, he's brought, he heard that you wrote a lot of the music, but I don't know if that's true. Um. That's a very interesting question. I think it goes back a ways because I think he taught all the guys in the band. Like I think he taught Albert and Nick Nick Valenci and Julian guitar. He was their teacher on guitar. So he laid the foundation for what they were able to do. And I guess Julian wrote a lot of the parts on the guitar. So I think that JP's contribution of raising these guys in this very uh, proficient, and high level of musical knowledge and ability, I would attribute that to some of his influence. And I actually saw Julian come up to him and say things like, you know, I was thinking of changing this solo. What would like someone in rock and roll, like in the 60s, what, it would, what mode would they have worked in on this kind of chord change? And he would say, like Mixolydian, it's like these. And so Julian would say, oh, thanks, thanks. And he'd go away and come up with a solo based on some communications he might have had right then and there with JP. Um, so that's that's what I know about. 